our guest is standing by, so let me go ahead and uh, get out the Drac phone. <laughs> yes. I can't help it. you got to play Zachary Drac is back. It just lends itself to, 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 to jokes, to puns. I can't help it. Um, all right. Our guest is standing by. Let's go ahead and give him a call. Or lying in his coffin. Bye. <laughs> See? It just happens. You can't help it. Good evening. <laughs> I know for sure who I am talking to, so let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is known on the street by Raphael Peter Engel, but if you don't recognize that name, you will surely recognize the non de plume, Zandor Vorkov. We're very excited to welcome him to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Good evening. I am the Count of Darkness, the Lord of the Manor of Carpathia. I bid you welcome back. And it's so legendary because, believe me, to have an actor only portray a role one time and be as damn well known as you are, legendary, it's incredible. Well, thank you very much. The crazy question I want to ask, which, you know, a lot of people are scratching their heads and wondering why. We tried to find you for a long time, and we got a hold of Van Helsing. It didn't work. We did many things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you were kind of, I don't know if you want to use the word recluse or not, but like you were nowhere to be found after that movie, and people wanted you for interviews and, and stage appearances and stuff. And you were either saying no if they actually got to you, or you couldn't be found, period. And you didn't really surface till they had a screening down in Hollywood of the film, and now you're out there and doing some appearances of press. Why all of a sudden have you come out into the public to where, or why were you hiding or maybe not in focus before? I'll try to answer those in sequence. <laughs> um, I uh, was living a, a kind of a, a quiet life. I had uh, other interests primarily. I was beginning to work in improv theater something called Playback Theater, which is pretty world-renowned. And uh, I worked with young people. I taught it. I participated and uh, just had another life altogether. I had done this film as a favor for uh, Al and Sam. Yeah. Um, I was in their uh, friendship for a totally other purpose, but they had a... Um, of uh, someone who is uh, scheduled to uh, do the role of Dracula in their uh, <laughs> their third try, and uh, hey, just he let me interrupt wasn't for, able to do it. Just and, let me interrupt uh, for one second here. That's a really good point. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but to put a feather in your cap, to know that you took over a role that was supposed to be John Carradine, right? Right. Yeah. So Al saw something, and um, I, uh, I kind of backed away, saying, this isn't for me, and he coaxed me into it, and I said, well, you know, I was just back from Vietnam, and I was a young man living in New York, and, and uh, I said, it'll be an adventure, yeah. so that's what we did, and then after a, a brief appearance in a second film for them, um, I got back to my life, and... Uh, didn't kind of surface, as you mentioned, until I started getting phone calls. And um, Sam, uh, the producer and writer and partner of Al Adamson, had given my number to a couple of people, I guess thinking that it would help coax me out. And <laughs> I said, thank you very much, but uh, no thank you. And uh, it wasn't until, um, I guess, about... Five years ago, I've kind of lost track. Uh, uh, David Gregory uh, did a, a wonderful documentary on the, the life and death of Al Adamson. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he found me and asked if uh, he could come in and interview me. And um, when I saw the quality of his work, he had sent me uh, some uh, videos he had done. I said, yeah, this is not about me. This is about Al, who was a really good guy, and I'll do it. So that happened, and uh, four years later, which was probably 2019, 
he got in touch with me and he said, it's a big success, the documentary, and we'd like to have you come to Hollywood. We're going to be showing the documentary in Dracula vs. Frankenstein. And so I went, and uh, when the, uh, the documentary was over, there were questions and answers, and people were asking me all kinds of questions. There were eight or nine people on the stage, but it seemed to be uh, they were trying to figure out where have you been, like you were saying. Yeah. And when, the sh when everything was over, I got swamped by the audience. With, uh, they had photographs and, and uh, posters and memorabilia and asking me to sign this stuff. And um, I, I, I'm going to divert for a moment. Being a Vietnam vet, I came back with a bladder uh, challenge. Of, so I uh, had uh, watched the documentary and wasn't expecting to spend that time uh, afterwards. And I kept signing autographs and talking to people. And finally I said, you know, I got to pee. <laughs> And oh. some voice said, Dracula doesn't pee. You know, I said that, too, when uh, you wrote to my daughter, who's the other host here, and you said, you know, I'm excited, looking forward to it, glad to come on your show, although it's my bedtime. I was like, Dracula doesn't have a bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so all in all, it was well, basically that you uh, wanted to do other things. I mean, did you not like acting, or...? No, it wasn't that I didn't like acting. I was new to it. Um, I just uh, am pretty much a nonviolent person. And uh, I saw very uh, little, uh, few films that had violence in them. And uh, I had seen the original uh, uh, Dracula with Bela Lugosi, Blood is the Life. So I was attuned to that, mm -hmm. but short of that, I had other interests, and um, it wasn't until the thing in Hollywood that opened my eyes to what a huge uh, audience it, there was out there, and Sam Sherman, who you, I guess you previously interviewed, right. uh, kept telling me, you have no idea, you know, the reach, you know, this thing, MGM... Tel uh, owns the television rights. This thing's been shown all over the world, and I just shifted gears. I just said, you know, I, I I'm going to address and find out what this is really about, right. and now, it's about darkness. Obviously, everybody was so excited uh, when you, you know, quote unquote, resurfaced. But I understand. I had read an article. Tell me if this is true or not. But when you had went to the screening in L.A., you brought your wife. And did she not know uh, about Dracula versus Frankenstein or how much of a following it had? Because I had read she looked at you when you were being swarmed with fans and was like, what the hell is going on? Well, no, she knew, interestingly enough. <laughs> she, her whole family, um, uh, when they were growing up and she was a younger person, they had, you know, television night and they watched all these kinds of things. And she and her sister had seen the movie uh, as a, not a young woman, but you know, uh, not a, not a teenager. Mm -hmm. And when I met her, and uh, I didn't say anything about it, and she didn't remember how I looked, you know, in the movie. Uh, if you like clown white, uh, hopefully nobody remembers. But uh, <laughs> well, there's another thing you have to be I'm, proud of. You're the first one to do the clown white makeup before Johnny Depp ruined <laughs> a vampire image in clown white. Well, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about Kiss and their clown white and a few other people, and uh, supposedly I predate uh, these folks yeah. in terms of the clown white, which is one of the, the fun parts of the movie. Uh, basically, in Hollywood, I had a makeup person and... and two little things they stuck in my gums that really hurt and um, you know real makeup when what they needed to reshoot the ending so they reshot it and they came to New York and um, it was just like an overnight thing and uh, Al said somebody uh, give some uh, makeup to Drac and they 
slapped on clown white and these big black uh, eyes and handed me a pair of uh, Halloween plastic things. <laughs> and it was, it was like, all right. And only when I saw the finished product did I realize, oh, my God, what did I do? <laughs> Alan Sam, they found that secret. And it's too bad I mentioned the Dark Shadows movie with Johnny Depp. I don't even know if you've even seen it. But they missed it. They missed the point of being able to take something that, that's slocky and something that's a little corny and make an art out of it. Alan Sam got it right. I mean, oh, yeah. it doesn't matter whether you got clown white on. It wouldn't matter if they put a tail on you. Your presence and the way you talked and your look just sold it. I mean, for somebody that that was just their first film, you were incredible. Thank you. Now, I wanted to ask you, uh, because with... With Dracula versus Frankenstein being such a a drive-in movie gem, and it's renowned amongst cult movie fans, uh, there has been a lot of fodder that has said that they thought that yours was the corniest or the cheesiest Dracula portrayal ever happened out there. What is your opinion of that? Because I'll tell you, honestly, I thought you were great. <laughs> I was just having fun, and, you know, I'll tell you a little story uh, that makes it possibly all come home. When we were shooting in Hollywood, you know, they were long days and nights, and, and it, I think it was the second night, and um, I, uh, we were outside on the fire escape of the, uh, the sound stage. And we are doing our thing. I had Regina, uh, the heroine, and I was menacing her before the monster menaced me. And I give this speech about, I don't remember what it was, but it was long and it had no commas in between the words or the sentences. <laughs> right. And I just, it was like oratorio. And I was, you know, uh, just... Dun, 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 uh -huh. and, Whatever it was that I said, when I was done and there was a pause, the crew applauded. And I took that as a huge compliment. That's right. You know, these are people that see this stuff all the time. But, the you know, the sound person, the lighting person, you know, the people that were there doing whatever they were doing, they, they bravo or whatever. You know, they said, Al said cut, and then they went, this was great. So that made me feel very good that, oh, I was acting. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I have to tell you the funniest, and I don't personally see it, but the funniest comment I saw online was they referred to you as Count Zapula? Yep. Well, at least it wasn't Count Chocula. Well, is that be you know. <laughs> that's because of Frank Zappa, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> Frank Zappa, the I'm sure The long and the thin face. <laughs> now, and along curiously <laughs> enough... I lived in an apartment in California uh, that he uh, lived in when he was writing a greeting card saying before he became Frank Zappa. <laughs> <laughs> well, the presence of how uh, things cross. Right. The presence of you is so great, and the look, and I think the beard really added to it. As far as the dialect and the way you talked, did you base that on any other character from a movie, maybe other Draculas? And as far as you yourself, did you draw from uh, ethnicity? I mean, what what is your national origin? Uh, I'm not from this planet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from out there. That's right. Hollywood alone um, is out there. I actually, you know, I had given some thought. I, I knew what... Lugosi did, and and uh, I think I may have seen. Oh, the other thing, yeah, I saw him in Abbott and Costello meet uh, Frankenstein. So, you know, I was a kid, and that was kind of fun. And yeah. uh, I actually wore the cape when doing the Dracula movie that he wore. That's what I heard that that uh, they went to Hollywood costumes or Hollywood, right. costumes, yeah, and and they said you better take care of this. Lugosi wore this. And it's uh, Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. My God, you had to be nervous wearing that. <laughs> no, actually, I, uh, that's where the acting came in. 
<laughs> well, I, I do. put on the cape, and suddenly I could act. I, I do hear, though. Not that, everybody would agree with that. Right. <laughs> I, I do hear that, that while you say you weren't nervous about it, which I can believe because you were very, you know, steadfast in the role, I guess you made everybody else nervous because they had the original uh, spark generator equipment from Strick Hayden that was, you know, shooting off all the sparks and everything, electrical surges, and you were just flying around there. You were not flying literally, but like, you know, walking around fast and bringing your arms and your cape up and over around the sparks and over top yeah, of the well, sea. I, I paid a lot of attention when I got on. They said, watch it, Drac, this thing is live. So I kind of <laughs> noticed where things were, and then I emoted with my arms. I mean, I have to move my arms right. if I'm going to fly, right? Right. 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 Exactly. <laughs> well, there was kind of a rumor that was false, and I don't know where they get these things from. I can see now, I see my notes, that John Bloom, who was one of the guys that played the monster, I guess he quit somewhere between the film, and they had to bring another guy to use, like, the rubber mask, uh, that everybody was saying that you were a, a banker or a stockbroker or a something stock like that. Broker. That's yeah. what I had been introduced to uh, Al and Sam about. I had family friends who uh, he was a stockbroker and I had mentioned it to somebody who knew Sam and he brought us together and Al would come in from Hollywood and, and we'd, we'd talk and uh, you know and uh, somehow it was mentioned uh, I had set up a screening with this guy uh, to show uh, Al and Sam's films and potentially the Dracula film I guess and uh, I think that kind of got spun to the fact that I was a stockbroker yeah. and not the uh, the guy who set up the screening. I think running a record store is much more interesting. <laughs> definitely. Well, you now, definitely. Terry had mentioned uh, Terry had mentioned that you had taken on the role because uh, John Carradine wasn't able to do it. But he he wanted you, more money, is can, what it was. Yeah. <laughs> can you expand on that a little bit? Because I I understand that that it was Al's idea to have you take it, but Sam wasn't too sure, right? No, no, no. Sam was very sure. <laughs> well, when I think the third time that we met, when Al came to New York and we all got together, and we're sitting in a restaurant, the place we went every time they came, and I'm sitting next to Al and. Sam's across from us, and Al was like kind of slumped in his chair. Now, this is a guy who's got a lot of energy. He's, he's you know, a, an athlete. He's all these things, and he wasn't any of those things at night. And I, I said, what's going on? And he, he kind of like, mm -hmm. and so Sam said, well, you know, Carradine's uh, uh, manager or something wanted more money, and uh, so now we're kind of trying to figure it out, at which point, uh, Al kind of sat up in his chair and took a look at me. He said, he'll do it. <laughs> and Sam said, what do you mean he'll do? What, what, what are you talking about? He said, no, I have a feeling about him. Uh, I think he, he would make a great Dracula. He said, and Sam said, what? He, nobody knows him. You know, everybody knows Carradine. You know, Al said, no, uh, this, uh, uh, this is going to work. And I said, oh, okay, I'm not into it, but um, I'm happy with your enthusiasm. Yeah. It's going to be a great adventure. And God knows it has been. Right. Around then and maybe now, uh, does people recognize you for the film? Yeah, it's happened quite a bit throughout my life. Uh, this was like 50 years ago, Yeah. Right. this film. And so now... Um, with the uh, assistance with Sam and David Sering, I have a, uh, I'm going to be at the Chiller Festival at the end of April. Wow! And I've act, you know to meet people. I really want to get in touch with folks and uh, find out you know the what I, what happened in Hollywood just was amazing. That it was like what what is going on? So I'll be at Chiller as one of the guests and probably telling stories, for, so I hear, and um, it'll be fun. They, some special rings are being made, and uh, who knows what's going to happen, but I'm looking forward to meeting a bunch of fans, and we'll see where it all goes. And you know, I'm still trying to talk to them to give me a ring, but I haven't, <laughs> haven't been successful yet. Uh, people was asking me about the ring. Now, I know they got a jeweler to make the ring, and the jeweler demanded... I'm putting the ring on display in the store, 
when the movie was done, but then he turned around and said the ring was stolen. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, it was. I think it was a, a friend or a, a, a relative of Sam's. And I know uh, after every shoot, Sam said, give me the ring back. And, yeah. I, and uh, that was the last I heard about it. And then Sam told me that uh, what you just said, that um, someone stole it. Right. Now, you know you had to be good because any other movie that had those cheap Walmart, Kmart kind of things, I was... Oh God! But you made it work. Now you said they well, they put they put all the money into the ring. He had oh, to yeah. suffer through the plastic <laughs> right, fangs. Right. But you kind of alluded to it. But I'd like to have you allude a little bit more. Uh, problems with the teeth. I know you said they hurt like hell, right? Yeah, uh, both both coasts in in Hollywood. They gave me these individual, you know, made for movie fangs that they kind of glue and they stick up where they the incisors are. So that's fun. I mean, it's like being at a dentist in front of, of a camera. And uh, then when we did the thing with the store-bought fangs, uh, they, uh, well, have you ever worn them for Halloween? Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, when I was young, I used to pretend I was a vampire so I could kind of neck with a girl. You could hurt a girl with that thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, she really bled for real. You know, I was like, oh. Oh, oh. okay. Wow. <laughs> So uh, let me ask, because uh, we're having you know listeners that are submitting questions while we're doing this. Yeah, these are your fans. Um, they wanted to know whose idea it was uh, to bring in two very uh, noticeable features about your character. One was the the voice changer or the echo, <laughs> and the and the other was whose idea was it? I mean, I know you had kind of mentioned this earlier. But with the white face, was that planned from the beginning, uh, or you know, was that Al? Was that Sam? How did that get brought in? But mostly the voice changer, I think everybody's asking about. Well, Sam was, you know, Sam is one of the most creative guys you, know, you can imagine. He's schooled in film, and you know, he's like a mother hen. Don't <laughs> uh, well, he'll probably hear this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was all over the set, and he keep kept coming up with ideas. So in the beginning, if uh, there wasn't any echo, and at some point the echo was there, and uh, you know it kind of, as I recall, I'm going to actually see the film again next week. I'm going to have a showing for some fans in my home who've been uh, bugging me before I go to Chiller, and so um, I'll get to see it again, but. Uh, my recollection, it wasn't throughout the whole film, so that made it very funny to me. And, right. and I think that's part of the uh, allure for, the, for everybody that it's, you know, it's three films edited together, and the Dracula is the, the last piece that made it work, because the, the first two uh, weren't going anywhere, and, and Sam's brilliance, he heard something, and he kind of followed through on it, and he added the whole dimension of Dracula. And then he's into gimmicks. You know, he what's going to make this work? And so he decided to use the echo chamber. The part of the white face was uh, low-budget filmmaking. <laughs> there you go. Well, I would assume that with uh, the same with the echo chamber... That was it also Sam's idea to do the, the, the light that shone up under your chin? Because I don't think that was through the whole the, movie either. The light, the light under the chin is an effect. It's got to be the cheapest effect. <laughs> but effective. <laughs> well, effective. You, yeah. you got everything. Um, <laughs> every time I walked on stage, there was something else. <laughs> and so they put the light under the, on, on the floor beneath me. And I'm doing my lines, and I realized I blinked a couple of times. So when Al said, cut, I said, you saw that I blinked. Oh, yeah, we'll cut it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> never did. Never did. You know, there's a lot of parents. I hold this up, and they have a, a, a wonderful, wild and crazy film that uh, one, I read somewhere online that some man said, this this was so bad, it was great. It, right, it is. Right. It's a secret. Secret of a true uh, B-movie, cult film, whatever you want to call it, that is so bad, it's good. And it was, absolutely. Right. I will tell you, though, and we told Sam this, that in this day and age where literally anybody can get a, a camera from Best Buy and make their own movie on YouTube, uh, 
what Sam and Al did is Fellini. It is not. Well, I <laughs> turned. To, I talked to uh, quote unquote so bad. We had it's the great. guy that made the documentary. Uh, the guy that made the documentary on Al that you were in, right? And he had mentioned Dracula versus Frankenstein, and I had said that was the best movie ever made. He started laughing. <laughs> he was he was laughing his butt off. Uh, a couple of other a couple of other questions uh, from the audience. Uh, one that's coming in a lot is that they wanted to know what it was like working with screen legends uh, like Lon Chaney Jr. and J. Carol Nash. Um, I, uh, since this was uh, three different films, I didn't work with uh, Mr. Chaney, uh, but I did work with uh, Mr. Nash, and uh, I didn't realize at the time that he was in an immense amount of pain. He yeah. had a lot of uh, medical things going on. And uh, he was, in my opinion, he was kind of cranky. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was just I didn't, you know, he he wasn't anything at me, uh, per se. He, we did have one little I- incident that he just kind of blew something off, like, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, he, but you didn't know what the pain level was yeah. and why, uh, where that was coming from. So I was delighted to find other people who had been in the film who had similar experiences and um, that was his last film, it was Mr. Cheney's last film too and from what Sam told me that um, before Mr. Um, uh, I forgot his name, Nash uh, passed, he had contacted Sam and Sam sent him I think a, a copy of something and he was delighted to see the film. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it, was, it was a nice tribute. And if he was cranky, who can blame him? I know what you know, chronic pain is, and to have him go through what he did, and, and, and even to a point that he had one disability, a lot of people didn't know. He only had one eye that worked. He had a glass eye, right? That's what I heard. I yeah. didn't realize that yeah. you know, after the fact. Now, ultimately, I had heard that you got along really well, and she was totally uh, a sweetheart with uh, Regina Carroll, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I spent time with them. They brought me to their uh, home, and uh, we hung out together, and Al and I shot hoops. And uh, Gina um, was telling me that one of her uh, desires was to teach kids, because she knew I had taught kids. I had taught you know, things to kids, and I was a, a, a big uh, father figure to a lot of, uh, you know, I guess not homeless, but street kids, and, you know, I'm, I'm I, the fact that I uh, am not uh, into violence, even though you wouldn't know it by the end of the movie, but uh, 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 I'm looking to, you know, to do good things, and it's, it's kind of interesting to friends and family that I would do this film, and at the end of the film, tear, tear the Frankenstein monster from limb to limb. And they said, how were you able to do that? You're not a violent person. And I said, I guess I'm a better actor than people knew. <laughs> now, I guess there's an alternate but, ending that I saw that uh, you were staked rather than the way you wound up dying. Uh, why did they not choose that ending? And, and do you know anything about uh, who made a decision? Um, I think Sam uh, did, you know, the, that I love the ending. I mean, uh, what was happening uh, for the uh, people who, you know, probably didn't put it together, because whoever does when you're looking at a film piece together, they had me laying on the ground. They told the cameraman to not stop rolling, just to cover it with his hand. They got all the people they could around me on the ground, and with all that clown white, they, Al would say, you know, action, and I would, you know, wiggle and make faces and then cut, and then they take the dirt and the leaves and everything else, and they just throw it in my face and, you know, knock it around a little, and, and they kept doing that three or four times, and finally at the end they had a, you know, a, a face, and uh, that was the end of Dracula. Yeah, it was a great deterioration scene, great scene. Yeah. It I, was, it was a lot of fun. Now, I know about the perils on a set because I'd done a little acting and I've had directors that tried to endanger my life thinking I was a stuntman when I wasn't. And I know how that goes. Now, I heard you had a harrowing car ride that you almost crapped your pants because here you are as a passenger as Dracula. And, uh, no, no, the no, 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 no
Oh, that's what that's the other film. Where, yeah. uh, uh, I was a prime minister of this fictional country, and we were up in Hollywood Hills shooting that, and they had a, a I believe, a professional stunt driver, uh. but it was hilly and curvy, and they had blocked off the roads and did everything else, and they off we go, and going down that hill, it was, you know, him whipping the wheel around. I actually had a moment there, I said, Oh my God! I've come to Hollywood to die. You know? <laughs> so I, I take it the guy wasn't as good a driver as Forey Ackerman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you saw what happened to Forey. <laughs> yeah. So what was he like? I mean, everybody said he was the nicest guy, and I know he, he really, loved being in it. He really was. He was a good guy, and I think that was the only time I understand that anybody offered him a role in the film, even though he did all the work he did about. Famous monsters. Yeah, he did other like cameos, like ninety-two cameos or something. But his scene it wasn't just a cameo; it was actual role, role. and it was really good. Yeah. I know he had said on a DVD extra that uh, when he died, he tried to hold his breath and he wanted it to be the best death scene ever because he hates it when he sees an actor blink an eye or something. They're supposed to be dead. He held his breath and he was laying there and he's like, "When are you gonna?" Al forgot to cut. <laughs> so he's laying there holding his breath and almost suffocating. So that uh, had to be funny. Uh, another question uh, from the audience. They're wanting to know if you could give uh, a little bit of uh, background or any stories about what was the reshoot of the fight scene uh, at the end of Dracula vs. Frankenstein because that wasn't originally planned. And uh, they're wanting to know, did you do all of your own stunts with that? And also, uh, can you talk a little bit about Shelley West, you, Weiss? You had actually Weiss. known him outside of the film, right? Right. I brought him into the film. Uh, all right, I'll try to r roll around this. Um, the uh, My understanding, once again, and I think this was... Sam is the definitive expert on this, but there were uh, editing problems with the, the first uh, uh, iteration of the film, and um, I didn't hear anything about it for months later when Al or Sam called me and said, we've got to reshoot the ending. We're going to shoot it in, in uh, upstate New York. Are you available? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And uh, it was... Uh, no dialogue, and so they said, but you know, we're coming out there, Regina's coming, obviously, but we, we're not going to fly Bloom out because it's, a, you know, it's an expense we don't need since there's no dialogue, so we'll, we'll get a mask, and do you know any large guys, you know, because John was, I think, s uh, seven feet tall or something. And uh, so I got my friend Shelley. He owned the record store, and he was a big, uh, you know, full of life guy. And I mentioned to him about this, and he was like a child. He said, "Oh my God! Oh my God! I can't <laughs> wait!" <laughs> and uh, he did it, and had a great time. And um, that's where he came from. <laughs> did, did you ever hear John Bloom ever complain uh, as to him thinking about leaving the film or whatever? No, no, he, 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 he had a good sense of humor. He was an accountant. Where I wasn't a stockbroker, he was an accountant. <laughs> and uh, he was um, doing the film and then having to go and do accounting and then driving and all of this stuff, and it kind of wore on him. And I think the story goes that when... I pull him, you know, when I open the, the the coffin at the beginning of the film in the cemetery, he's, you know, kind of sleeping, but it was for real. Okay. He was tired and he would <laughs> nod off, you know. And, uh, no, I, I, he, he was a nice guy. You know, I mean, everybody was, it was a good, Al had a way of attracting good people. You know, they had their moments. I wasn't around for any but those two films, and I've heard all kinds of stories. But uh, he did whatever it took to, to get the job done, and he got a lot of people working. And even though it was only for fried chicken once in a <laughs> while, um, you know, he helped a lot of people, and some of them went on to bigger and better things. 
Uh, it was interesting to see Russ Hamlin. I thought he was particularly great. Did yeah, you get he's, to- he's, he's great, and I'm looking forward to seeing him. He'll be at the Chiller Festival. Oh, boy. Nice. As he said, they're talking about Twin Peaks. Just go up and say, hey, remember that movie? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. since we were uh, talking about Al, uh, another question that just came in from the listeners is uh, they were wanting to know how you found out about Al's untimely death and uh, kind of how you felt about that. I would imagine you, it came as quite a shock. It sure did. No, actually, Sam uh, uh, called me and I think he said, sit down. I said, oh boy, when I hear those words. Uh, and he told me what happened, and uh, it, w- it was totally a shock. And I actually, I collect uh, sayings and special writings, and you know, because I, I really looking to see a better world. So I, I kind of, you know, have my day to day life inspirational, so I can do whatever is for me to do. Mm-hmm. And I had one, uh, it was a Native American uh, uh, ceremony prayer, and I uh, sent it to Sam, and he did the eulogy. I think it's called a eulogy at the funeral. Right. And uh, and, uh, it really touched a lot of people, and uh, it made me feel really good that I, even at the end, I had a connection with Al. It's still hard to believe are, are you satisfied in knowing that they got the guy that, that murdered al um yeah i mean you know it's it's i look at the world a, a little different than many people as much as the, these things are horrendous and we're in the midst of them big time you know i i've known a lot of bullies in my life and and i've experienced bullies being uh little boys in in big bodies who can do harm and they're just not getting enough love you know they're not being respected they're not being listened to and uh i think we're all complicit in that because it's so fast-paced this planet even before what's going on in the last few years uh, and so it just I just hope that people are learning from what's been taking place and, you know, paying attention to helping each other and being a little kinder, more respectful and understanding. And I think there's that saying, you know, walk a mile in my shoes and you'll know. In fact, uh, based on this uh, experience in Hollywood and my coming back, so to speak, I've been having a conversation with a longtime friend of mine who had some intuition about a film. He said, there's something going to happen uh, uh, when you go to Hollywood. And he was right. And when I told him what it was, you know, I was swamped by all these fans, he said, you know, we should do a film. So we have written a, uh, a screen treatment called Dracula the, the the Great Awakening, and we have it as a fantasy, and and it will be the Dracula that most people know, but things change, and there's a really powerful backstory about why he became Dracula, and how he moves into the future. It's not airy-fairy, but it has elements you will never see in a Dracula movie. That is awesome. Oh, man, I just want to get up and dance right now. That's incredible. <laughs> I mean, based on, you know, the uh, applause and everything you got at, at the get-togethers, that's going to be so well-received. I know you found that out because recently, you know, in doing these, these things for Drive Insanity, you, you did one, and I guess there was huge uh, amounts of people that was all just thrilled to death. Right, right, right. Well, yeah. I wanted to ask you, because kind of going in with, you know, uh, you as a person versus playing Dracula and, and you uh, giving back and, and being that kind of a person, you actually, I, I'm assuming, donned the cape again because you helped out with a blood drive uh, <laughs> campaign for, I guess Sam Sherman had a road show going on, I think it was last year or 2020, right? Um, I, the dates are all over the place, yeah. uh, but um, I, they, Sam and, and David Sering, who uh, is the man who kind of brings me out to these different uh, experiences and events, 
they wrote a, a public service announcement uh, that began with how I open your show, mm-hmm. and uh, then later in the, I think it's about a three minute thing. I, I show up as the uh, on camera with the white face and the black eyes <laughs> and uh, uh, do this opening, and then uh, halfway into it. I talk about please donate blood, and it's still, it's, it keeps with the corn, so it was fun. And uh, David Sering shows him in all the drive-ins, right. and so uh, because of that, um, uh, he had the idea. Since I li- I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and mm-hmm. he um, had uh, a woman who was helping doing the promotion contact. Uh, the local Red Cross, and they were just, they were having a, a blood drive at the big auditorium, so I, uh, they got me, and I showed up in uh, full regalia, and the, uh, NBC and CBS and others were there, and uh, so there, there's a, a an auditorium full of people on tables and machines and everything else, and so it's my turn, and I you know, with my cape, I saunter over to the the, the computer, and they're taking the in, in, intake and uh, give me your finger, and I stick out my finger. They <laughs> jab it, they put it on the slab, and they say, "You can't donate. You don't have enough cells." Oh. Red bullet, <laughs> and everybody went nuts. <laughs> and wow. what do you think I said? I don't know. What'd you say? I guess I'm anemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also heard that at your appearances you did the blood oath. Now, I don't know. There, there was a, a film, a uh, little well, short film, that was shown when they were showing Chris Lee Dracula films back when I was a kid, and it was a blood oath, and they had some guy all made up, and he stood up and did it. Is that the same oath, or, or was it something that I, was newly written? I don't, I don't think so, because I don't know about the other ones, yeah. but... Uh, uh, Sam and, and David, uh, uh, Sam and Dave, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> They're a soul man. Yeah, right. <laughs> they put it together. They're great with this stuff. They come up with stuff that's totally out there, but they wrote the oath that I uh, repeated for the public service announcement. Do you by chance remember any of it? Um... No. <laughs> I didn't warn you ahead of time. I should have warned you ahead of time. Now, we want to talk about, because I, I mentioned it in error, but now I want to actually talk about it. Uh, your other film that you did. Uh, Brain which, of Blood. Brain of Blood, which talks about brains and blood, and you know it's got to be good. Talk about your role, even though I understand. I haven't seen it. I'm going to see it tonight. Uh, even though your role is a little smaller, I guess it was an interesting film. Talk about your role and how that came about. Um, I was available and uh, they needed whoever they could get and it was a a quick one and uh, um, do you know about you know what the film's about it, it's the typical uh, South Pacific uh, kind of cannibal well it was related to the wasn't it an offshoot of the, of the Blood Island films yeah no no it's, this is different this was about the brain transplant ah. Alan Sam specifically Sam has a a, a, a pension for you know the news and anything that looks interesting that he can shape into something he did so instead of a heart transplant uh, uh, which was interesting and, and available uh, I think at the time he made a, a, a brain transplant and they had a they took it to a foreign country and the, they were you know doing the number with uh, the king or whatever the man was and I was the um, prime minister, and I was, you know, I had the full beard and all the hair, the goatee. I didn't have a full beard. I had a goatee, and uh, I was wearing one of these uh, winter caps, you know, they wear, right. and a, a coat. And um, I'm just really glad that so much stuff, uh, this was all done before 911. Yeah. Yeah. As, uh, the way I look, when I see myself, it's like, oh, my God, I would never get through customs. <laughs> you know, it was like I, I looked like someone that they could easily <laughs> uh, pull aside. Right. And so uh, <laughs> that's why I, sh- I shaved it really thin. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it, it was affecting for Dracula versus Frankenstein the way you look, you know. Yeah, it was it was appropriate there, but because it was a known character, and of course I had white face. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> well, well, this this has been a trip. <laughs> it has been fun. Well, as we wrap up, I just want to ask. I mean, you had kind of given us the great news that you and your your friend are working on a treatment. Uh, how do we find out more information about if this is moving along? I mean, I, I know that you you were kind of you know in seclusion for a little while, and and we can always, of course, go to David Searing, Drive Insanity. Of I, course, I believe you have a Facebook page, right? But how can people keep up to date no, with you? I actually don't. Uh, I don't use any of the social media at this point. Smart. Um, <laughs> I hate Facebook. I guess you know we can stay in touch and. Uh, Sam and, uh, and and David would know uh, because I will keep them appraised. Um, you know, the man I'm working, he's up in Vermont, and he's a very busy uh, person, and uh, I have my responsibilities. So we kind of fit this thing. We wrote this over many months and, you know, kind of shaped it. We had some guidance on uh, how to put together a film treatment. We just have a very long uh, thing, and... Uh, so we're we're kind of shopping around. People are are liking what they're reading as a, a story. It's not by far a finished product, but it there's enough there that people are going, oh my god, I want to read more. You know, I want right. to see more. I want to see this thing done. So you know, from uh, the only person I uh, actually sent it to is a local resident, is Sissy Spacek. Ah. Okay. Very good. Oh, I love her. Yeah. yeah, she would she would be good in one of the major roles. It would be so different from what she's done. You know, right. a lot of people don't know. Scary. A lot of people don't even know that she was part of production for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard these pieces that she you know, all the way up to an Academy Award. Yeah, yeah. how about that? Yeah. I, I suggest you get a hold of Chiller. <laughs> not Chiller. Not not the convention. I meant the, it's Chiller. The, the, the network. The network. Yeah, yeah, show the network. the network. All right, well, Raphael, I want to thank you so much for joining us. It has been such a pleasure and an honor to chat with you. A very special thank you to you, and, of course, a very special thank you I wanted to mention to David Searing from Drive Insanity. Everybody should check out his website. He's the man. And, He's the of man. course, Sam Sherman, who we love and adore as well. Um, but thank you for spending a little bit of your Saturday night with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me, and to be continued. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keep in touch, Raphael. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. All right, good night.